Once the sea had taken back their diamond-shaped footprints, there was no sign that they had ever been there, any more than King Haggard's castle had been. The only difference was that Molly Brew remembered unicorns very well. It's good that she went without saying goodbye, she said to herself. I would have been stupid. I'm going to be stupid in a minute anyway, but it really is better like this. Then a warmth moved over her cheek and into her hair like sunlight, and she turned and put her arms around the unicorn's neck. Oh, you stayed, she whispered. You stayed. She was about to be very foolish then and ask, Will you stay? But the unicorn slipped gently from her and moved to where Prince Lear lay with his dark blue eyes already losing their color. She stood over him as he had guarded the Lady Amalthea. She can restore him, Schmendrick said softly. A unicorn's horn is proof against death itself. Molly looked closely at him, as she had not done for a long time, and she saw that he had come at last to his power and his beginning. She could not say how she knew, for no wild glory burned about him, and no recognizable omens occurred in his honor. Just at that moment, he was Schmendrick the Magician as ever, and yet, somehow, it was for the first time. It was long that the unicorn stood by Prince Lear before she touched him with her horn. For all that her quest had ended joyously, there was weariness in the way she held herself, and a sadness in her beauty that Molly had never seen. It suddenly seemed to her that the unicorn's sorrow was not for Lear, but for the lost girl who could not be brought back, for the Lady Amalthea who might have lived happily ever after with her prince. The unicorn bowed her head, and her horn glanced across Lear's chin as clumsily as a first kiss. He sat up blinking, smiling at something long ago. Father, he said in a quick wondering voice, Father, I had a dream. Then he saw the unicorn and he rose to his feet as the blood on his face began to shine and move again. He said, I was dead. The unicorn touched him a second time, over the heart, letting her horn rest there for a little space. They were both trembling. Prince Lear put his hands out to her like words. She said, I remember you. I remember. When I was dead, Prince Lear began, but she was away. Not a stone rattled down after her, not a bush tore out as she sprang up the cliff. She went as lightly as the shadow of a bird, and when she looked back with one cloven foot poised, and the sunlight on her sides with her head and neck absurdly fragile for the burden of the horn, then each of the three below called to her in pain. She turned and vanished. But Molly Grew saw their voices thump home into her like arrows, and even more than she wished the unicorn back, she wished that she had not called. Prince Lear said, As soon as I saw her, I knew that I had been dead. It was so the other time when I looked down from my father's tower and saw her. He glanced up then and drew in his breath. It was the only sound of grief for King Haggard that any living thing had ever made. Was it I? he whispered. The curse said that I would be the one to bring the castle down. But I would never have done it. He was not good to me. But it was only because I was not what he wanted. Is it my doing that he was fallen? Schmendrick replied, if you had not tried to save the unicorn, she would never have turned on the red bull and driven him into the sea. It was the red bull who made the overflow, and so set the other unicorns free, and it was they who destroyed the castle. Would you have it otherwise, knowing this? Prince Lear shook his head, but he said nothing. Molly asked, But why did the bull run from her? 
Why didn't he stand and fight? There was no sign of him when he looked out to sea, though he was surely too vast to have swum out in sight so out of sight in so short a time. But whether he reached some other shore, or whether the water drew even his great bulk down at last, none of them knew until long after, and he was never again seen in that kingdom. The Red Bull never fights, Schmendrick said. He conquers, but he never fights. He turned to Prince Lear and put a hand on his shoulder. Now you are the king, he said. He touched Molly as well, said something that was more of a whistle than a word, and the three of them floated up in the air like milkweed plumes to the top of the cliff. Molly was not frightened. The magic lifted her as gently as though she were a note of music and it were singing for her. She could feel that it was never very far from being wild and dangerous, but she was sorry when it set her down. No stone of the castle remained, nor any scar. The earth was not even a shade paler where it had stood. Four young men in rusty, ragged armor wandered gaping through the vanished corridors and turned around and around in the absence that had been the great hall. When they saw Lear, Molly, and Schmendrick, they came running towards them, laughing. They fell on their knees before Lear and cried out toge together, Your Majesty, long live King Lear! Lear blushed and actually tried to pull them to their feet. Never mind that, he mumbled. Never mind that. Who are you? He peered in amazement from one face to the next. I know you. I do know you, but how can it be? It is true, your majesty, the first of the young men said happily. We are indeed King Haggard's men-at-arms, the same who served him for so many cold and weary years. We fled the castle after you disappeared into the clock, for the Red Bull was roaring, and all the towers were trembling, and we were afraid. We knew that the old curse must be coming home at last. A great wave took the castle, said a second man-at-arms, exactly as the witch foretold. I saw it go spilling down the cliff as slowly as snow, and why we did not go with it I cannot tell. The wave parted to go around us, another man said, as I never saw any wave do. It was a strange water, like the ghost of a wave, boiling with a rainbow light, and for a moment it seemed to me... He rubbed his eyes and shrugged and smiled helplessly. I don't know. It was like a dream. But what has happened to you all? Lear demand demanded. You were old men when I was born, and now you are younger than I am. What miracle is this? The three who had spoken giggled and looked embarrassed, but the fourth man replied, It is the miracle of meaning what we say. Once we told the Am Lady Amalthea that we would grow young again if she wished it so, and we must have been telling the truth. Where is she? We will go to her aid if it means facing the Red Bull himself. King Lear said, She is gone. Find my horse and saddle him. Find my horse. His voice was harsh and hungry, and the men-at-arms scrambled to obey their new lord.